Hi, it's Dr. Parikh. Uh, so one thing, or really the main thing in my mind that uh, the next couple chapters in the book cover are how you are, you know, there's one talk happening, but oof, that happens sometimes when I do back-to-back -back videos. Uh, there may be one talk happening, but there are multiple conversations. So I'm taking you down a little bit of a rabbit hole. Uh, and this gets in, you know, we, we'll talk about families and systems later. Every child is born into a different family. And here's why. The first part is uh, typically children have different timings, obviously multiples. So twins, triplets, and so on are different. But typically uh, children are born at different points in the adult's lives, in the parents' lives, in the grandparents' lives, in their siblings' lives. So everybody is around them is at a different age. There's also differences in world events. Parenting in times of pandemic is very different than parenting was before the pandemic. Um, and, you know, with technology changing so quickly, I could imagine if you have children two, 10 years apart, you may navigate very different sorts of issues uh, with things like social media and tech uh, with each child, even though they're in the same family. Uh, also, each person, again, somewhat with the limitation of twins, are born into a different family constellation. So when we talk about family constellation, we think of the arrangement of everyone pre-existing in the family. Uh, so people are coming in and out of the family quite often, you know, in, in over a lifetime, quite often. People get married, people get divorced, people are born, people die. Um, the, you know, the person who used to be the youngest is now the middle child, and this fluctuate, you know, these changes ripple throughout the system. Um, even things like people relocating. Uh, and for some families, like military families, that happens quite often. For other families, it's more rare, but it's also, you know, the, you know, we moved into a different house and that changed the way our family functioned. Uh, or grandparents moved nearby. Um, there's also, you know, relationships are constantly getting closer and getting further apart. And so it may be, you know, this cousin is suddenly closer and, uh, you know, and it may be both a relocation and then becoming more emotionally close. It could also be people drifting apart or even cutting off uh, from each other. Uh, so from the moment of birth, children are coming into different families. Um, we also have, and these things apply to twins as well, we have sex, so the biological parts you're born with, which are usually clear-cut, but not quite as often as you might think. Uh, and then we also have gender expression, which is, uh, I, can, I think of, is not just the gender you identify with, so I identify as a woman, I identify as a man, I identify as binary, um, or as non-binary. It also has to do with how you choose to express that. So... Uh, if you, you know, what kind of jewelry you wear, if any, what kinds of hobbies and interests you have, how much makeup you wear, if any, uh, and there's norms for men and women. Uh, and so you may fall in different parts. So if we take me right this moment, what you can see and hear of me, uh, you can hear my voice is fairly high pitched. You can see that I have long hair. You can also see, I don't really do much with it. It just kind of hangs there or gets pulled back. Um, you can see and maybe tell that I'm wearing zero makeup. I've, you know, at different times in my life I have. Right now it makes my eyes water if I wear even a little mascara and so I just don't bother most of the time. I might wear some lipstick but it rubs off and annoys me. Um, but you can see then that I have a necklace, I have fairly feminine earrings, uh, and then I'm wearing, it, it's hard to even tell what I'm wearing, but a fairly, you know, a, a more open neckline, kind of a drapey shirt, so fairly, fairly feminine clothes. Um, so you can kind of take these bits and pieces of information and put together a sense of how feminine, uh, stereotypically feminine am I? How much do I conform to uh, ideals for women? So we have, uh, you might, you know, so you might have a child who uh, identifies as a boy or a girl, but if baseball is really important in that family, there's also the question of how much that child expresses interest in that baseball value. Uh, which kind of 
overlaps, I pointed at my screen. That's so helpful. Uh, it interacts with abilities and interests. Oh, that's not what I wanted to do. So we have sex and gender expression, which is beyond just do you feel like a boy or a girl, but also how girly or how boy are you? Uh, and people can interpret that differently too. Uh, I get very frustrated. I, um, I have a son who at time of recording is 29 months old. And uh, it's funny what family pick up on because I share a lot of things that we do. And uh, when I share something like him playing with cars or just being kind of rough and tumble, I get lots of, you know, oh, he's all boy. Uh, but then I post photos of him, you know, playing with his stuffed animals. Like he just put his little stuffed Abby from Sesame Street. He put her down for a nap yesterday and it was very cute. Uh, wanted us to turn on lullabies and everything or putting on jewelry for fun. And people, you know, I don't have any pushback necessarily to that from my friends and family members, but it's just sort of, it's not given a gender label. Um, so you, you know, there's, there's a lot that has to do with how people conform or don't conform and how that interacts with family expectations. And, you know, keep in mind, families may expect different things. Some families may expect very strong traditional gender roles. Some may expect uh, a kind of both. So I want you to, you know, clean up nice and look very feminine when we go out, but I want you to do the barn work and help with the chores when we're home, which is kind of a lot of the house I was raised in. Um, then there's temperament. Uh, and this is, again, where twins can be very different. I have only had one child. Uh, I do know that the position he liked from all, his earliest ultrasounds is still his favorite position when he goes to sleep. He goes like this. Um, but I've heard from people who've had multiple pregnancies that uh, even from, you know, from their behavior in the womb, you can tell that kids are just different. So even before they reach the outside, um, people just have different ways of being that draws out different things. Um, it's really hard when your baby just cries and cries and cries. Uh, it's really hard to feel that warmth and that empathy after about three hours of constant crying. Um, even if you love them more than anything in the world, it's really hard to respond as warmly and lovingly uh, to a difficult kid. Um, and then there's abilities and interests. So how well do you fit with your family overall? Are there things that set you out uh, and make you special? Are there things that kind of make you seem to not fit. And again, this could be a strength or a weakness that makes you fit or not fit. Um, my spouse and I are not terribly athletic. And so if our kid ends up being athletic, we're, if it, he cares about it, we'll try to support him. But honestly, it'll feel a little weird. Um, I'm quite comfortable having him do, you know, youth sports, be super mediocre at them, and then find one or two physical things to continue doing uh, later on. That's, that's cool with me. Um, whereas I have other branches of my family that are extremely athletic uh, and are very, very proud of their child's involvement, or their children's involvement in sports and would have a hard time coping if it wasn't there. Remember all this when we talk about family systems. Uh, I will try to remember to refer back to this rather than doing the whole thing again. So this was probably more detailed than it needed to be for this minute, but again, it all is relevant for the course. But the idea here is that even within a family, each child is experiencing each other member, or each member experiences all the other members differently uh, than the person next to them. I do grief and loss, that's my focus area, and we talk about how, you know, when someone dies, each member of the family lost someone different because they had a different relationship. They had different things that were special and important and difficult. So just like a family, each person has all of this stuff that they're bringing and they're, the context is different for each of them. Each conversation is different. Um, each person is having a different conversation. They may have different goals and this could be like short-term what I want to do in this conversation. It could be long-term, what I want out of life, the kind of person I want to be. It could be just what's on their minds lately. Uh, you know, what did they hear on the news recently that's sticking out to them? They might have different priori priorities. And this happens a lot uh, with my spouse and I. I share somewhere in a later slide, excuse me, 
I'm often very afraid of um, losing things, of getting disappointed, whereas my husband is much more afraid of, of missing out. And so it can be very difficult to decide what to, you know, to coordinate our approaches because we have these different priorities. Um, you also, you know, you might have differences in how much people prioritize being on time. Uh, there's just a lot of differences in priorities. Um, you might have different interpretations for what specific words mean or different situations mean. This is much bigger if you are from different, even different parts of the U.S., but especially different countries, um, different first languages, um, or, you know, come, even if your first language is the same, to be from places different enough where the meanings are slightly different of certain words. Uh, you also might be, you know, you might be more tuned into different parts of the conversation. And so different things might stand out to each of you. Uh, and you also have different norms for communicating. Again, that's partly culturally based. Um, but so, you know, some, you know, one person may seem like they're not being very emotionally reactive. And it turns out that for them, that's actually quite expressive. Uh, I remember one time uh, I was with uh, my spouse and um, one of his family members was, uh, seemed vaguely disgruntled. And he was like, wow, they're really mad. Uh, so that was, you know, for that person, it was quite a bit of emotion to be showing. So how do you sync up and try to get into one conversation when you've got all of this stuff that's pushing you into different tracks? Part of it is, especially if you know it's gonna be a big conversation, try to choose the time, place, and format carefully. Um, if it's a big conversation, you know, say let's, let's put our phones away, let's choose a time that we're both calm. Um, it might be choosing to order out, you know, order delivery so that you don't have to clean up the kitchen to free up some time and energy for it. Uh, and as much as possible, look for common ground as a starting place. And I forget which chapter this concept gets in, introduced in, but I'm going to talk about the third story. Uh, that's the idea that it's kind of the most neutral version because each person is going to have a different story of what's happening. And so rather than starting in my story or your story, I want to start in the third story and then start introducing the idea that we have different views. We have our own stories of what's going on. Uh, check in with each other along the way. So it may be phrases like, let me see if I'm hearing you correctly. Uh, or saying, I'm not sure I'm expressing myself clearly. Can you tell me what you just heard me say? Now, these sorts of phrases that are about sort of the process of what's happening, these can feel really uncomfortable to do in a casual relationship. Um, so it has to be someone you feel willing to be a little vulnerable with to risk doing these sorts of very direct things. Um, and you may need to talk a little bit about what you want to do and why you want to do it. Something that can also be helpful, uh, in my opinion, is if you're making a big decision together during or right after the conversation, take some notes about what you decided. If you're in a work situation, this can be a cover your butt thing where you can, you know, if you email, this is a summary of our conversation uh, that can protect you if later the person, you know, especially if it's your boss and they later say, well, you didn't do what I told you to do. And you're like, no, nope. I emailed you this right after our conversation. You did not correct me. That's our record. Uh, so it could be a bit of a legalistic protection. Um, for me, genuinely, I forget what I decided. I just forget. Uh, so if, you know, if I ever tell you that you can have any sort of special treatment in my class, email me immediately. And usually I'm self-aware enough to say, can you email me to remind me that I told you you could do this thing? Um, So take notes and then also share them so that hopefully, you know, the person, if nothing else, you can say, look, I emailed it to you that day or I, you know, I showed it to you. I, I sent you a picture of what we wrote down and you didn't disagree. So it was, you know, that suggests that you thought the same thing. You could even ask the person to say, you know, can you confirm that, you know, do you have anything to change and can you confirm? So. I think the first step is just being aware of how very different the perspectives and the conversations can be. Uh, but then throughout this course, you will learn tools to figure out how to engage the person 
in not just draw them and pull them into your conversation, but how to meet them in a new conversation, which for me is a lot of overlapping with the third story. All right. Thanks. Bye.